Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders series, Asset Management Improvement Equipment Reliability. My name is Amanda and I'll be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our custom, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them, their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar is being hosted with Engineers Australia's industry partner, Hexagon. Hexagon is a global leader in digital reality solutions, combining sensor, software and autonomous technologies. Hexagon is putting data to work to boost efficiency, productivity, quality and safety across industrial manufacturing, infrastructure, public sector and mobility applications. Hexagon's Asset Lifecycle Intelligence Division helps clients design, construct and operate more profitable, safe and sustainable industrial facilities. They empower customers to unlock data, accelerate industrial project modernisation and digital maturity, increase productivity and move the sustainability needle. Today, we will hear from two speakers followed by our live audience Q&A and I encourage you to send questions through to our speakers by the chat box. I'd now like to welcome our first speaker, Julian Watts. Julian is a partner in the engineering and asset managed team within KPMG's Infrastructure Assets and Places Division and has more than 20 years experience leading teams that develop asset management frameworks and strategies across multiple sectors. Julian is a sector leader in transport and Asia Pacific lead for Infratech and has worked with asset owners and operators as some of the world's most complex transport, utilities, healthcare and government infrastructure across Australia, New Zealand, Asia, US, UAE and the UK. Please welcome. Julian Watts. Thanks for the intro, Amanda. I really appreciate the time and um, everyone being here to, to listen to these presentations. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm Julian Watts. I'm a partner at KPMG. I look after our engineering and asset management team. And I'm also um, a national chair for the Asset Management Council with the uh, data and asset management um, function within that. And I was hoping here to talk about systemizing asset performance management, uh, really focusing on within asset management, um, how we understand the performance of our assets and um, and some of the, the processes and, and practices we can adopt uh, to really realize value from our asset base. Uh, what I would uh, like to just start with is a quick acknowledgement to country, um, to all of our elders past, present and emerging and um, uh, acknowledge the, the lands that have brought us all where we are in our respective geographies. What I'd like to cover today is a, a few topics I'll talk about. Just go back to basics around asset management. What does that mean? Um, how do we describe it within the profession? And, um, and then step through a, a really systematic process about understanding asset performance management, how we plan uh, that management, how we uh, deliver a maintenance system, how we check that we have got the right um, metrics in place and, and how we can understand how the assets are behaving and degrading, and then how we review and act and, um, and deliver continual improvement. And I'll just touch at the end about how we can systemize those into the likes of digital twins and uh, get to a really automated future. So just on good asset management. And this is a topic that has uh, an untold amount of conceptual models, frameworks, diagrams um, coming out from a lot of the different um, industry bodies, uh, from our standards bodies. I've been involved in developing the international standard for asset management around ISO 55000 and a number of the, um, of the working groups around the world that have been involved in developing those. And one of the learnings, I guess, is to try and simplify these things, we've boiled them down to four key pillars. And if you like, 
Um, the first one there in pink is around the line of sight, and this is a really key um, cornerstone for asset management, really understanding the alignment between an organization, what are you trying to achieve as an organization, and how do you deliver that on the ground um, through your asset base and all of your activities. The next pillar is around whole of life, really understanding the trade-off between CapEx and OpEx, um, understanding across a whole of life of long life assets, as well as short life assets, what that means for decommissioning, for decarbonization, and how we can um, think about a, you know, a more recyclable future. Um, the next one is around defined value, the target in the middle, which is really how do we know what it is that we're trying to achieve and that everything hangs off that, that we can create value criteria for making trade-offs between investments in, in digital, investments in new infrastructure, investments in business change, and be able to compare those um, apples and apples through that defined value. Uh, and the last one is around whole of system, really focusing on the all of the interconnected um, activities that an organization delivers through its people, processes, information technology, and really understand from a business risk perspective, how they all impact and um, interact with each other. I wanted to also just paint a quick uh, landscape, if you like, across asset management. These are uh, well-known and well-trodden areas of um, enterprise systems, commercially off-the-shelf systems um, that you might have on the left-hand side around ERPs or enterprise resource planning. People would recognize software like uh, SAP or Oracle that would be in that space. Um, on the right-hand side, your project management tools like P6 and, and Microsoft Project. Um, and content management tools at the bottom like uh, SharePoint and, and other um, uh, common data environments. Then in the middle uh, area around asset management technology, and I'm just talking about the softwares uh, in the space. And this has um, uh, been building out over the number of years. The, the core one in the middle around enterprise asset management system is where we hang all of our assets, the registers, what we have, um, the specifications about those assets, um, then on the, the bottom right um, is this focus on, on this presentation around asset performance management, really focusing on the um, how we understand how the assets are behaving, degrading, the type of value modes that would be impacted, um, and all of our um, uh, all of our root cause analysis type activities that would go into APM. The bottom left about where are our assets, how do we manage spatial data, um, all of our complex geometry. And the top one around asset investment planning, which is really focused on the long-term forecasts, how we make sure that we secure budgets, um, that we can do those trade-offs that I mentioned in the pillars. Um, and these working together really present a bit of a landscape of the different technologies that, um, that come together to, to enable uh, good asset management from a software perspective. I talked before around the principles really focusing on the business value and people and competencies as well. Um, but because this presentation is focusing on asset performance management, I wanted to highlight where that fits into that landscape. What I'll do from a, an asset performance management perspective is put this into, um, if you like, a, a quality management uh, approach. All of the, the asset management uh, system, uh, quality management, health and safety, environmental management, um, management systems have all aligned under the um, under the common um, framework for Annex SL, and, and that really follows a, a plan, do, check, act type approach. And I've just put this together to try and give a sense of a framework for, for maintenance, for under, undertaking and understanding um, performance of our assets. And so that starts with the plan side of things. How do we plan for maintenance, understand the context requirements? Um, how do we do the maintenance in terms of setting the strategy um, understanding the activities that are undertaken and understanding the criticalities that gets us one side of that risk equation. And then how do we check and monitor that from the other side of the risk equation around the, the likelihood of an event occurring and uh, checking and monitoring the asset condition and performance. And then the lastly around uh, acting and reviewing and understanding um, the actions to, to rectify and understanding continual improvement. So if I just jump into the first one here around uh, planning from a maintenance perspective, um, three aspects here, really understanding the context of the organization, um, which is a key concept within asset management, 
the scope and boundaries of how an organization may operate within? Are they an operator maintainer? Are they an owner? Are they a custodian? Um, what are all of the, the scope boundaries within their decision-making remit? Um, and this is a key part of what you have control over um, uh, really is, is where the, you draw that line and understanding the impact that you might have upstream or downstream where it could be that you have a, a data center that you have customers that are critical customers. You could be a water organization um, that also has critical customers, but you also might sit within a, uh, within a wider value chain um, where customers use your assets to deliver further value. Um, the next one is around requirements, understanding the requirements and, and if you like those um, within those boundaries, how you deliver value and outcomes from your asset base, the specifications for individual asset types, what are the requirements for from an OEM or from a manufacturer that may be cascaded down, any regulatory or legal requirements that come through to deliver and make sure that you can um, maintain your compliance obligations. And the last one there is about uh, constraints. And really, um, once you've got those boundaries and you've understood the requ requirements, what are some of the constraints that you can put on um, unconstrained thinking that, that allows you to make sure that you're within your work practices, your, your budgets from a financial perspective, um, that you're able to access um, assets and what equipment availability that you might need for that. Um, and of course, um, our people and resources and um, how many we have what are the competency of those people? What activities can they undertake? And then if there's any future constraints around either growth or divestment of your asset base that you need to start to think about, how do we plan for these things? The next on the list was around do. So plan, do, check, act. We're on do here and um, got three parts here if you think of a maintenance system. So how do we set up the execution around maintenance? I'll start with um, maintenance strategy. I'll go through maintenance management um, and then understanding that one side of that risk equation around asset criticality and the, um, uh, and the impact that uh, assets can have. I'll just step through each of these individually. From a, um, within your maintenance system, when you're thinking about your maintenance strategies, this is a really key part to setting up uh, for success, to understanding um, what is the, what are the potential critical failures that can happen? What are those high failure rates um, that could, could occur? What are uh, things that um, from within your asset base, effectively testing some of the questions around um, how would failures and asset performance be enabled? Um, and how would you then address those failures? Um, so understanding things like root cause analysis that will get underneath the skin of um, what is the, how, what has caused an event, um, what has uh, been triggers for those causes and what might be uh, effective strategies that can put in place to um, reduce those triggers. Uh, and then really understanding things like failure mode analysis and, and for Mika. And this is something that I think will be um, talked about in the next session also. Uh, and when are we uh, getting into the when and how of asset maintenance when you're thinking about things like reliability center maintenance, risk-based maintenance, preventive maintenance schedules and optimization of those so that you can really focus on um, from a reliability perspective, are you getting the uptime that is needed? Are you investing at the right rate and have you optimized and understood when to stop doing maintenance as well? When is uh, fix on failure appropriate based on the asset and, and where it fits within uh, the portfolio? into the next phase of um, the do cycle and this is around the management system for your your maintenance so understanding um, the planning the scheduling the execution so when do i need to um, uh, find the resources um, that i that i need how many of them what type of full planning needs to be undertaken um, that can uh, really focus on the maintenance tasks that have to be undertaken um, and from a scheduling perspective, when do those people need to be available? And this is a challenge when you start to move into uh, more predictive spaces around maintenance that can be a bit more dynamic. Scheduling and setting up um, dynamic schedules is a challenge for, for humans because people like to have a, a, a plan-based schedule that they are doing X, Y, Z on these days or these months. Uh, whereas predictive and dynamic maintenance requires 
uh, you to be able to schedule those in as and when as needed and just in time activities um, present a challenge around, around uh, scheduling. From the execution side, who's going to do that? Do you have an outsource provider around that? Um, do they have the right uh, qualifications and specifications? How do you assign that work? Who is it going to go to? And how is that going to be undertaken and, and assured um, through from a compliance perspective? And how do you do quality um, monitoring? Um, and um, from that maintenance, how was it uh, conducted? And what was the result? Did you actually result? Did you um, resolve the failure? Um, have you elongated the life of that asset? And the last part of the do cycle is really um, understanding uh, the criticality of, of your asset base. Um, and this, this touches on when you are putting together your, your reliability centered maintenance program, um, what is the criticality of, of an asset within the system, if you like, of assets. And generally, an outcome is delivered from a, a suite of system of assets, not particularly any one asset. And so really understanding from an objectives perspective, what are the requirements coming back to your operating um, requirements, KPIs, uh, how much output do you need to deliver? And, um, and so that within your decision criteria, you can think about the operating context. You can think about the consequence and the likelihood and suitable criteria of weighting between um, those and how you might evaluate uh, the decision-making aspects. Then working through your criticality assessment, gathering the information um, and understanding what types of data-driven decisions can be undertaken uh, when we understand criticality and, and be able to take that assessment. And this is an area that, that is a challenge for a lot of organizations when you, when you think through a systems approach to understanding the impacts of assets and um, uh, enabling a more dynamic approach to assessing criticality as we have uh, changing operational needs, changing customer needs. Uh, and then of course, uh, monitor and review. And that's a, if you like, these iterative uh, review loops because I'll touch on review at the end of the plan to check out cycle also. I'll now move on to the next uh, segment, which was check, right? So check, check that you've, um, that the maintenance that has been undertaken is effective. Um, but also that the assets are behaving and degrading and um, operating in the uh, in the manner that you expect them to. And so when we look at designing things like condition programs, like designing performance monitoring programs, um, a, a really simple and repeatable process like this works very well. And um, uh, the uh, the first segment here is around design, design of that of that program. Um, and then go out and do the execution of that and assess, um, and then uh, close out with analyzing the data and understanding the health of your assets and your asset base. So I'll step to through each one of these individually. Um, and the key part here is having a repeatable process so that when you get back through that loop, you can then feed back into your asset knowledge, up uplift your asset knowledge, understand how the assets are, um, the information that you have available to make decisions. Um, which then leads into, uh, if I can't access all of my assets at once to do condition monitoring or to do performance monitoring, then taking a sampling approach is a great way of, of um, effectively a, um, uh, you know, systemizing and um, enabling a, a more mathematical approach to um, uh, subpopulations of assets and uh, categorizing assets within a, a group that have similar characteristics so that you can go out, undertake a sample, and capture the condition about um, the type of failure, the, the severity of the failure, um, and then extrapolate that uh, across the rest of the asset base. And uh, to do that, you really need, you really need to understand the standards um, for those assets, the specifications, as I mentioned earlier on, and um, what those failure modes are and what are the life ending failure modes that you might need to understand uh, and track. And once you have that uh, framework and, and design in place, then you can go out and do the execution of uh, either condition um, or performance monitoring. And so really either setting up the likes of ongoing monitoring through IoT devices, through um, uh, things like strain gauges that you might monitor the, you know, the growth of a, track, of a crack, um, but a lot of the time it is scheduling to get out into the asset base, into um, live operations, 
And so understanding scheduling and resources and availability of people, access requirements is a really key way of um, ensuring that you can set up a good survey uh, routine and, um, and forecast uh, so that you can collect the right information and really enable um, and test the validation of those maintenance strategies that have been put in place in the previous cycle. Uh, and then collecting that in the, in the most appropriate way, depending on the type of data that needs to be collected. Um, and as I say, that could be um, through photogrammetry, it could be through taking images of assets and doing AI extraction of, of faults. It could be through um, categorizing and assessing the, um, the defect that you can see so that you can later on assess what the actual condition is um, of that asset within the component tree or within the asset as a whole. And this is a key part to really understanding from an analyze perspective, what data have we captured? How can we understand the condition or the performance at an individual health level, at individual asset level, um, and how that rolls up to a whole of asset class. Um, so you might have an, an individual pump within a, within a pump system, but when you look at all of your pumps, you might find that these types of this manufacturer has degraded faster than others. Um, so really understanding that, that whole of uh, asset class health and then whole of network health and um, thinking about the outcome to, uh, to customers and, um, uh, and, and further down the value chain, what that network health might deliver, how you roll it up, uh, and how you can drive actions from that insight. The next stage in the process is around ACT. And so this is the, the continual improvement, making sure that you can execute any observations, any, uh, any uh, impacts that you can see within your asset base. And a key part here, um, I'll just step through these three parts around the effectiveness. So have you tested that um, your maintenance schedules and your performance monitoring is effective? Um, do you have the right documentation? Has that been embedded? Um, can you evidence that has been embedded? Um, is, is it effective from a deliverability perspective and that it's actually making the changes that you're looking for? And how do you test that it's continually improved? And so these are really common tests that we would do when if you might be doing uh, something like a post-project review or, or an audit. Uh, the next one is around reporting and really understanding from a, a decision making perspective, what is the right information that's needed, uh, what types and what frequency of review will be undertaken and, and who, which different governance forums would be, governance forums would be um, delivered that information. And the key part here is around how do you set the appropriate KPIs? Do you have lead and lag indicators against those KPIs? Um, have you communicated your reporting framework to the people that would be monitored? and the, the teams that will be monitored. Um, and then how can you structure your data in a way that allows you to do that, um, that reporting and through dashboards and, and other method, methodologies? Um, do you have the data coming through in the right format, the right frequency, the right level of detail and fidelity? And then um, around publishing that for the audience, really focusing on who the different people are, what decision makers uh, are in the room and what type of data and level of detail that they, those people would like to consume um, within their ability to act on that information. The last one there is around um, rectify. So once you've got, you're presented with these, uh, with how the performance is still being delivered or how the condition of the assets are, um, can you actually execute that? So um, thinking about um, confidence in delivering uh, your objectives, you know, the opposite of risk. Do you, do you have uncertainty in delivering your objectives? Um, how to lift confidence and really focus on what plans can be in place um, and focusing on the improvement uh, prioritization of those of those actions, uh, really focusing on the uh, the benefits that are delivered. So what's in it for me? And um, do you have the appropriate KPIs and incentives in place so that when there are actions to be undertaken, you can track and monitor those um, from a completion perspective and that you have uh, appropriate deadlines that are that are set around the level of criticality or the risk that's uh, presented. So that was the effectively the plan, do, check, act approach around um, asset performance uh, management. And just as we bring all of that together, uh, you'll be hearing a lot about like sort of digital twins around um, systemizing this into automation, leveraging artificial intelligence to, to try and standardize things. 
And um, we've been doing this for some time and, and developed a standardized framework for then looking at what are those critical use cases that you can start to standardize and to automate. Um, and we've got this five step process around um, what creates a, a very good digital twin um, from discovering the use cases to finding the problem. What is the, the actual problem that's being, um, that needs to be um, uh, solved for? Um, what are the individual roles and, and the users that, um, that have those challenges? So if you're, if you're thinking about um, the uptime of, uh, uh, of, a, of a rolling stock within a railway system, um, if you're thinking about the, the failure modes on, on doors that have a, one of the, the biggest um, impacts on, on real-time, uh, on-time performance, then really understanding what is the problem you're trying to solve for, um, what is the use case around that, what is going to be the benefits uh, that will be to solving that challenge, and then understanding what is the data that you're going to ingest from a real-world perspective, how can you capture that data, how would it be structured, what would be the, the, the as I say, fidelity and, and um, uh, frequency of that data, how it's going to come and be ingested into a platform and standardize and integrate that data together. The next one around analyzing that data. So what type of analysis based on the types of failure modes, based on the types of um, insights and decisions that might need to be made, there's all sorts of different types of analysis that you could do and, and whether if that's leveraging machine learning, it could just be about aggregating, it could be about um, extracting it and uh, extrapolating data across geographies. And then the presentation layer, but thinking about again, the audience, who are the people that are going to interact with a system? How do they want to interact? Do they want to have, um, you know, wall, a, 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 visualizations on a wall? Do they want to have hard copy paper? Do they want to have things on an iPad? Really understanding that presentation layer and, and what um, enables the right people to make right decisions at the right time. Uh, and none of this happens without good governance. And this is a key part that we see with a lot of digital twins that are, are developed that might just be a, a thought that you can go through a proof of concept and start up fast, but the cha challenge around starting up is that it's hard to scale up. And if you don't really understand governance from a data management perspective, how are you going to continually capture more use cases, uh, more problems, more benefits, um, ingest more data, analyze more options and, and present that to a wider audience. If you don't have that governance in place and understand um, how you're going to manage the um, the security, the cyber, um, the, um, the ownership of all of those use cases, then it, it is a challenge moving forward. But what this does is present an option, opportunity to really drive um, and, and realize value across um, our levers of cost, risk and performance. So just to conclude, and um, this is the, the last one here around how to have good conversations around asset performance management, um, really focusing on that line of sight. I, I talked about it at the start, aligning and really understanding um, organizational objectives, how that's delivered on the ground and how you can demonstrate that KPIs around monitoring are actually appropriate, that we're doing the right level of interventions and that we're able to um, pause and not make interventions when we don't need to and create more service disruption. Um, key takeaway around really focusing on the data that informs decisions. Um, we always love data, engineers love data and uh, we can't get enough of it until we have too much. So really being focused on what is the type of data that you need, just the right level of detail. Can you aggregate that and segregate that and, and enable the, um, a good informed decision making? Um, being clear on the value, having that honed um, sense of what are our objectives, do we have the appropriate quantitative and quantita qualitative metrics around those, and, um, and can we secure the appropriate funding um, as we put forward asset strategies and plans. And the last one, um, and most importantly around people, and you know, nothing gets done without, without our people and the competencies of those, of those people. So placing capability uplift and really making sure that we invest in, in knowledge, invest in, um, in future capability and, and understanding uh, why we do things, understanding the outcome that assets have on our communities uh, is, is a really key focus and, and a key takeaway I'd like people to have. 
So that concludes my presentation. I really appreciate everyone's time and I will be here for questions. Uh, hopefully people have, have captured a number of questions for us and we look forward to um, having a robust discussion later on. Thank you. Back to Amanda. I'd now like to welcome our second and final speaker, Kevin Price. Kevin has been in the enterprise asset management software industry for most of his professional career in product management and product strategy capacities. He currently serves as Hexagon's Asset Life Cycle Intelligence Strategic Advisor for the Digital Assets Portfolio. Prior to this role and the last 26 plus years, Kevin has been in roles that have held responsibility for product management, product marketing, and strategy functions for the Hexagon Enterprise Asset Management and MP2, iProcure, Spear Technologies, Energy Performance Management, and Asset Performance Management. Please welcome Kevin Price. Thank you, Amanda. I'm really excited to be able to participate today because this particular topic for me of course, is something that's near and dear. I've been working with this application environment of enterprise asset management, computerized maintenance management systems, asset performance, and reliability uh, my entire career. So I'm very excited to be able to, to have the chance to speak with all of you today. When we look at that overall career, there's been some things that um, have been stark in my life. I wanted to share that with you because I think they're important in this particular topic. The past 26 years, I've been involved in launching this EAM portfolio from an idea that was originally on a whiteboard. And what we did then was we worked with a lot of key strategic customers, partners, and a loads of different regions around the world to understand what we could do to make EAM the best that it could be. And when we did that, we worked on many different industries around the world, some that were highly regulated, loads of compliance, some that were very basic, some that carried a high level of asset intensity, some that had to have high reliability, and many, many others. So when we think about where we've come, where we are with this particular portfolio, we're very, very, very confident that this particular portfolio can deliver at any level in your organization. Let's take a moment first and understand who Hexagon is. Hexagon is a global leader in digital reality solutions. What they intend to do in that particular approach is to be able to offer solutions that not only provide visualizations of asset infrastructures, but then go down deep into those structures definitions, how they're designed, how they're planned, how they're implemented, and do it in a way that has sustainability at its core among other principles. When we think about Hexagon, we think about what can be done. We start to look at the world in two different lenses. The very first we look at, believe it or not, is through that digital twin. And that's because when we look at solutions through the Hexagon lens, what we're looking at is those design tools that Hexagon is known for. Having been in this particular space for a little over 40 years, they have tremendous tools to be able to do designs of asset infrastructures, entire facilities, and more. So what they're looking at is a design of what the real world should look like. On top of that, they provide a geo-reference point of view. So where those structures should be in relation to other pieces of structure, whether that's large geospatial techniques or whether it's something that's local, as in a building or perhaps an HVAC unit or perhaps things that are linear. What they do on top of that is they want to compare that to what the real world is experiencing, what the real world is seeing. And when you do that, you have to have a lot of really precise capture tools. With the acquisition of Leica many years ago, we we're able to bring that forth because we we're able to look at a laser, LIDAR, and ground penetrating radar to be able to produce what the real world is. And then overlay that to what we expect it to be within the digital twin. And when you do that, you have deltas, you have differences, you have opportunities to be able to compare those two. And then, of course, you want to enact an action upon those. A task, maybe a work event, maybe an inspection event, maybe a triage event, loads of different types of things that are built into it. With Hexagon technology, its intention is to not only be able to identify that 
design expectation to the real world, locate the differences between the two, allow work streams, workflows, and activities to occur, and then at some point, help our customers, our prospects, and our partners scale those decisions into autonomous capability. This is where we live. This is how we excel. This is where we bring about change throughout our entire world. When we think about Hexagon, we think about not only one aspect, we have to look at it at many different structures. We think about the asset lifecycle intelligence that we have within the division of EAM, the division of reliability, the division of predictive maintenance, the division for preventive maintenance, the division for responsive, for asset condition. We also look at manufacturing intelligence and ways that you can be able to provide sensor controls and visibility into those assets at any given time. You also think about the autonomy, the positioning that we just talked about and trying to understand how to be able to relay what that asset is expected to do versus what it is. And of course, some real life implementations on industries such as mining, agriculture, and more. When we think about all that Hexagon is, there is a massive amount of technology that one could deploy. But is it necessary? It depends on the industry. It depends on the region of the world. It depends on who you are and what your challenges are. Reliability can mean very different things to one industry versus the next, one customer versus the next, and one region versus the next. We're here to provide that plethora of opportunity to be able to optimize your business, reduce your cost, reduce your risk, or perhaps increase your profit margin. With extraordinary tools, such as those that we find within the digital asset structures of the Asset Lifecycle Intelligence Division. Within that Asset Lifecycle Intelligence Division, we focus on six separate tenants. Solutions that plan, solutions that design and execute, solutions that focus on operation, maintenance, and security. We group those together into two major functions, digital projects and digital assets. When we look at the opportunities this way, what we find is an environment that not only has asset management at its core, the operation and maintain phase, but it's actually before that. And why that is, is because when you look at your facility in, that you're in right now, or the operations that you have right now, there was a design process that went into it. That design actually was a function of computer-aided design and several other tools. Before that, there was actually a plan that went along to be able to fund that design to be able to think about how that was laid out. And of course, there was an execution phase to actually manufacture or fabricate that piece of equipment or that site. These are tools that we look at when we think about asset lifecycle intelligence and we think about the entire structure of the industrial facility. Carrying that forward, when the handover happens from the design of that facility and it goes into actual operation, there's tools that you'll need to do and you'll need to look at to be able to understand how to operate the equipment structures within it in a very safe way, in a risk concerned way, in a compliance way, and in ways that adhere to regulation in every step. There's also tools designed to be able to maintain that equipment and keep it going, have that return on investment be as high as it can, and be able to plan for future investments within those structures. And of course, every one of these pieces of equipment are becoming more and more technical. Access points are becoming more and more exposed, making sure that you have the security layer that you need to have on those pieces of equipment to not only address security concerns of today, but well into the future. When we focus now just on the asset side, we think about the solutions that we have within the EAM portfolio. And we think about the types of assets that are maintained in that portfolio. With over 3,500 customers within that portfolio, we have a lot of types. We have some that are very structured, looking at one of the largest buildings in the world or looking at some of those structures that have different elements of even ownership at different levels. We think about assets that move either on the road or on rail or in the water, in the air. We think about assets that have a certain linearity to them. We think about assets that are, have pressure on them, that have gravity on them. We think about assets that have different types of component structures to them, that have high levels of sophistication, high levels of calibration. We think about assets in every way. The benefit that a solution like EAM can have is that benefit of experience for you. 
as a first line of codes in SATI 6, this particular structure gives you the opportunity to manage any asset of any kind under any risk, under any reliability concern in any way. It's an advantage that we extend to many. When we think about the practice of asset management, we think about what the benefits are for the types of asset management one wants to consider. We think about maintenance in these different ways. There's many different books that are written. There's many different evolutions on maturity models that are written. There's lots of organizations that are out there that have varied content. But to the extent that this is built, we see reaction at the very early stage. So this is fix it when it breaks. And what you do in that structure and the benefits that you have is you now have an asset system because you have that asset registry. You have very simple parts that are built into it and different types of procedures that are built in because you're only recording events as they break down. Scaling up, you have more benefits because there's more opportunities because you're thinking about asset management differently. You're incorporating maintenance 2.0, which is the ability to look at how you prepare to manage those assets better, how you schedule work to be done, how you schedule the engineering processes to be done, how you look at collaboration with different teams for those particular assets and begin to have that step into the direction of what would be maintenance 3.0, which is more on the prevention side. This is when we started to look at preventive maintenance procedures. We started to look at targeted approaches. We started to look at opportunities to be able to use our assets and our people and our material and our budget and those impacted by those assets in a big way. We're looking at collaboration bigger and we're trying to understand how to best utilize the budget that we have for those assets. Scaling on further, we started to look at predicting those particular failing events. We all know that it's going to fail at some point, but the question is when and what can we do about it? And more specifically, what can we do preventively to be able to build that out? Loads of opportunity in this asset management world and things that we have gone through, things that we have solutions at, deployment measures that are built into it, and of course, implementation successes in great demand. When we think about reliability and we think about those different types of preventive maintenance maturity models, we want to understand why even consider it. Why is pretty basic because not doing the valid, safe, least is very costly. Everyone wants to say that because there's different averages one can look at of the type of reactive work that you do or non-value value added functions that you do or different types of preventive works that you do. With each step along the way, there's opportunity. And we view this in many different ways. Of course, we wanna look at keeping maintenance technicians busy. We wanna keep wrenches turning. We wanna look at assets in a very specific lens of reliability and profitability. We want to look at life extension. We want to look at what we try to do in a bigger way. And also we want to avoid work that's unnecessary. We want to avoid downtime work or equipment reactive work because a lot of that work, by the time it gets to that point, is up to three times longer to do. And costs between four and 10 times more to do than would be just to do the proactive work. At a very basic understanding, take a look at the vehicle that you may have or maybe within your friend network. When you look at rechanging the oil on that, it's cheaper to do that. And it's more effective to do that. And it's healthier on the asset to do that. than, of course, just letting no oil be in your car, locking up the engine, locking up the transmission, and then very, very expensive effort to be able to reproduce that. I realize that's a rudimentary example, but the idea behind it is being able to do preventive work is where we want to be. And there's different standards that we can look at. There's different stages that we tend to look at is we tend to understand what type of phase our customers are in by understanding what type of knowledge that they have of maintenance, what type of practice they have built into it, and what type of efforts they've gone through it. And this particular stage we've used for a very long time, but it still resonates really well. When we find that our customers are in the operation phase or operation stage, it really is an understanding that is not as deep from asset management in terms of maintenance prevention. You're still looking to do in that reactive mode, similar to what we saw before in maintenance 1.0. Here we have a lot of resources that are wasted. We have a lot of failures that go on. We also have a lot of safety considerations and a lot of different types of misallocated resources. As we start to continue on this continuum to stage two and then to stage three, 
we find that we understand what our ROI is, our return on investment for those assets. We start to think about what is that asset supposed to do? Why is it supposed to help my organization? And how often is it starting to fail? We look at things like mean time between failure. We look at things like overall equipment effectiveness ratings. We look at different types of mechanisms to fully understand that asset as best we can. Then we started to look a little bit more about what we can do to optimize that schedule and build it out. And then of course, at the end, look at how we can innovate to be able to have those data elements that we capture about those assets along with what we see within the operation of it as we start to think about maintenance models. For us, what this has meant in our journey is to focus on four basic pillars. We see this as extensions of what many in the market term as enterprise asset management and others term as asset performance management, but we think and we believe and we've seen that this is true asset lifecycle support. It's an end-to-end -end process for asset management. It focuses on the very basics of what you find in these models of maintenance 1.0 or early stages and on. It focuses on work management functions to make sure that you have the right tools at the right place at the right time with the right technician. Last thing we want to be able to see is technicians that are sitting behind the computer. Now, the reason why we say that is because we want technicians in the field doing what technicians do best. He or she is in the field working on those pieces of equipment, turning wrenches, anal analyzing equipment details, doing whatever they can to be able to make sure those assets are running safely, effectively, and are producing what they need to produce. That's why we then look at performance management. And we build tools around that as well to be able to understand the different types of indices that we may be paying attention to. These could be sustainability index. These could be things that are on mean time between failures, mean time to repairs, asset condition definitions, operational efficiency definitions. We need to have ability to be able to identify what performance management is for us based on those assets. We need to identify the KPIs that are best for us, for that equipment, for our operation, for our use. On further, we look at the investment planning technique. And what we do with that is once we understand how the asset is structured and how we're doing work on it, and how we're measuring it in performance, we want to start to invest correctly into that asset. Not just say all things being equal, this is what it should look like for the next 12 to 18 months. What we want to see is what does that look like for 36 months? What does that look like for four years, five years, seven years, 10 years? And we want to plan for that. Not just in an investment plan for those assets, but even a capital plan for scaling that further. We broke this down and based on our history to seven basic steps of predictive and reliability centered maintenance. We've written on this many different times, lots of different trade magazines over the years. We've done loads of webinars and presentations on it. It really boils down to what we've seen and what we've implemented and what we developed solutions to in seven basic fronts. From left to right, what you'll see is introducing the reliability concepts and understanding risk. You cannot start an organization in the direction of thinking reliability if they have no basis for that, that understanding. It's very difficult. It's very difficult for them to be able to accept or even understand the concepts that you'll talk about, you'll learn about in, in webinars like this, if there is no basis of understanding what reliability is. There's also no basis of understanding and agreement upon what risk is. So in the very first step in this process, what we typically like to do is go through a process of education of what reliability is in industrial engineering, what reliability is in your operation, what reliability is in your organizations, perhaps in your competitive environment. We also want to come to an agreement of what risk is. When an asset fails, what does it mean? When it fails partially, what does it mean? If somebody gets hurt, what does that mean? And we want to be able to document that in as much detail as we can. Once we do that, it provides us that opportunity to then go into that second step. That second step is really streamlining the processes by which we manage those assets. We're getting the routine through standard definitions. We wanna be able to respond to pieces of equipment that are breaking down or respond to work requests or respond to service requests, do whatever we can, but make sure it's routine and structured. When we know that routine, when we know that structure, when we set up things like preventive maintenance schedules or different type of inspection rounds or lubrication rounds, we can expect their cost. We can expect their outcome. 
we can also anticipate them in ways in which they're run. This is why it's very natural to see that next phase or that next step of planning cash flow to budget planning. What this means is it gives me an opportunity now that I know what that routine is and I know how much it costs and I know what the avoidance elements are, shouldn't I now be able to at least put a, a budget structure to that so I can anticipate? I can say with confidence because of that structure, because of that setup, that all things being equal, it should cost me this much. So I should budget in my maintenance budget once a year, this certain amount with a percentage of variability. Or maybe I can look at other elements, but the idea is I should now, because of those standards and because of those definitions, be able to look at how to structure that correctly. Once I do that, it bleeds into the fourth. The fourth is what we see is being able to predict those future by recognizing different benefit elements to it. Predicting future is now we go from that preventive maintenance measures to starting going into the predictive maintenance. And that's when we bring in sensor definitions. That's when we bring in the concepts of asset condition. That's when we start to look at what can we do to do a better job of understanding this asset. And when we do that, there are many different benefits that we can recognize. Cost avoidance, labor avoidance, we can avoid um, in the manufacturing process, disrupted goods, disrupted work in progress. We can look at different safety considerations, compliance violations. We want to understand if we can predict failure based on how we're maintaining those assets and the, and the budget that we put behind it. Are there benefits that we can recognize? Are there wins that we can recognize? Is there a way in which we can be able to go in and say, this worked, or maybe this didn't work? If we can do that, the next step is to be able to understand when those environment those situations occur we can provide a way to say okay if the particular revolutions per minute or the heat intensity or perhaps the vibration or even sound if all of those come together in a certain way how do i get a notice that something's about to occur how do i provide an early warning before that happens this is when we get into those predictive models we started to look at many different algorithmic approaches, perhaps. We look at extracting data. We look at getting data science involved. We started to look at ways that we can be able to predict when that failure condition is going to happen. Because again, we've structured those stream, the, the, the assets in a certain way. We streamlined the work processes behind it. We know how to fund them and keep them going. Now we can start to look at what we can do to not only predict that future, understand when and how that's going to occur. And when you can do that, now you can prioritize better. That's that sixth step. That prioritization is very important because now I can focus on where to be able to put my investment, my time, because I know how much now it's going to cost. I also know what the benefits are going to be if I do focus on it. And I also know what the risk is going to be if I don't. When I do something like that, that's when we start to get in a very organizational benefit approach. And I put the last one down here, seven, is compliance and, and, and uh, regulation. And the main reason for that is because really that should be an underlying factor of every step of this. And you should make sure when you're looking at maintenance strategies, reliability strategies, strategies that bring about risk mitigation, risk control, risk identification, and more, that you keep those into mind because you could go through this entire process, which could take years of a journey. and miss a cue, miss a compliance, and you're back to ground zero. This is an example, and I encourage you to look at your own organizations, and understand what reliability means, or understand what risk means, or understand what those conditions are for those assets when they do fail, and understand how much you're funding them now, or what the funding should be, and why do you argue over these types of things, and what can you do behind it? And engage us, or engage others, to be able to help you with the tools that are built to do this. We have asset performance management capabilities and what we offer at Enterprise Asset Management to understand things like equipment ranking. Equipment ranking gives us that definition of an agreed upon risk variable. It also allows us to run statistical analysis like Weibel, Laplace, Sefmika, Mercado, to be able to understand what that decay is for that asset over time. Markup transitions are also very important in this particular mechanism and other different types of statistical tools being able to leverage not only the asset management data that you've structured, the work that you've structured, but have it as a natural process. This is that early warning technique that we talked about in those steps. Being able to understand how that asset is performing as it should and where it should is very different 
from seeing it reactively. And it's also very costly when you look at it from that reactive perspective, of course. We also want to make sure that we template out this as much as we can. These reliability state and maintenance templates are things that we want to be able to apply as a practice and a standard. We mentioned that earlier. These standards are things that you can really benefit from. It's not a complete cookie cutter, but it allows you to get your organization to critical assets of similar make, manufacturer, or perhaps even use in the same model or the same mode of operation from a safety perspective, from a compliance perspective, from a risk perspective, and more. These are things that we want to be able to utilize. These are examples of, of capabilities that we've built over the years to be able to support it. So when we think about reliability-centered maintenance, we want to also understand how we can use the system to understand failure mitigation. And we do so by looking not only at the templates or the structures or the standard processes that we build in, but we want to also do so in a very regimented way. What we like to incorporate is something called an RPN that you'll see in this slide, which stands for the risk priority number. Risk priority numbers are things that we can give in a very quantifiable way, of course, to understand when a particular risk has been met and it's not mitigated. When we see something that has been mitigated and done something about ahead of time, if there's a failure severity that rises because of it, what's the occurrence and what's the probability of that actually occurring? These are things that we want to model, that we want to understand, that we want to get to. And this is where you look at that seven steps and you look at predicting the future and understanding what the benefits could be. Now, getting to this point will take some time. It'll take some buy-in. It'll take some structure creation. It'll take a lot more than you may be aware of at the moment. But what this will get you to is the ability to have a better structure on how to create a better preventive maintenance measure, create a better pattern, create a better plan, to do better work on how to be able to manage that asset with reliability-centered maintenance topics in mind. One of those that we typically do is pretty basic, um, but a lot of people skip the step, is looking at root cause analysis. In EAM, what we look at is understanding root cause analysis at the case of the piece of equipment what the cost is, what the productivity hours are, what the impact is. So once we understand that a failure event occurs, we want to understand why. We understand the different approaches, the five whys, as we call it, or different routes that we have for it. And you want to be able to structure those too. It's not just the assets and the materials and the people, but it's the actual selection of the root cause failure as well. The failure effects cause analysis, those particular tools that we have in the application that not always get used, can be critical to understanding why that asset failed. It's also critical to understanding why you have risk to begin with for that particular asset. Once we understand that, we can be able to mitigate that in the right way. We can identify the right preventive maintenance. Maybe we have to go back out and do another triage or condition understanding from it, or maybe some automated text that's built into it. And of course, finally, we can identify the, the type of corrective action that we wanna be able to, to see. All of this for a very common goal that everyone wants to see is bringing that asset back into uptime operation. Anything that we can do in the process of identifying why an asset's failure we want to do, but we want to structure it. We want to build it in a way that's procedural. We want to have it captured in a way that our employees are educated in doing. And of course, we want to have it built out to the tools that we have in the field that are best used for it. Our particular approach is the root cause analysis fields within not only the asset, but within the work process, the inspection process, the triage process, the service process are all part of everything that we do. When we start to identify that, we identify the failure mode, we identify the mitigation technique or the reason why, and then we start to go into further detail what that corrective action is. These are things that we built into the application um, because again, we've, we had our first line of code with this product in 1986. We've learned a lot. With nearly 3,500 customers within the portfolio, we've had a lot of experience. We have a lot of partners that can help you understand these different functions, these different capabilities into the right methodology that works for you, for your organization, for your equipment, and for your process. When you get a moment, we have loads of case studies that are out there. Um, some may mirror your operation, some may be similar in what you do, some may be related to your region. You'll find pieces of equipment that are some of the largest around the world 
that actually have no precedent before them. So creating maintenance management practices is very new from scratch, if you will. You'll see different types of videos that are associated with it, different types of write-ups, different types of benefit analysis that are done. It's built out very deeply and very well within the case study structures that we have. You can see a couple that are here. I personally like looking at some of our videos. Um, I think they go out in really good depth. You can see some that are built in here. Um, examples of ones that were done with Cal Tire. Um, they did predictive maintenance models with their tires, uh, which can be very expensive in the mining operation. As you can imagine, these tires are 12, 15 feet tall and um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And when they fail, entire operations shut down. So they want to be able to predict when those failures occur and they've got a great story. They've done a lot of work for it. There's also a lot of other capabilities within, within the Hexagon tool set that you'll see um, in different videos that, that you may come across. These are things, again, that we have a plethora of experience in. We have a plethora of examples to point you to, and we're very excited to get that chance. So when we think about what this means, um, we think about the opportunity to introduce reliability. Um, within the context of Hexagon and thinking back with what they're doing and that, that definition of that smart digital reality is they're looking again at that that digital twin environment overlaid with what's happening in the real world. And they're looking for differences between the two. When we think about it from an EAM perspective, we think about how does EAM play into that particular smart digital reality. What we cannot avoid thinking is the metadata about those assets. What can we do to understand the asset better? And what other structures are related to it? Are there different types of models to consider that are better than others? Are there 2D visualizations that we can look at P and ID diagrams or can we do that further as the 3D diagrams? Or are there different types of ways that we can be able to see our assets within that smart digital reality to really have impact, to help communicate, to help scale it within the organization? Again, the very first step in that seven step process is looking at educating what reliability is, educating on what risk is, and what better way to do it to not only incorporate the engineering function, but the design function, the build function, the maintenance function, the technical function, and provide it in a way that's extraordinarily elegant. That's why when we think about the different types of ways that we incorporate the smart digital reality and the different types of ways that we bring about digital projects and the different types of ways that we bring about digital assets, we find tremendous opportunity at every level. I implore you to give us a chance to be able to understand how these tools can help you how the processes and projects that we offer today have been successful and what we can do to be able to benefit your organization, both in the short, medium, and of course, long-term. So let's take a moment and really sit back and think about where this could go in terms of not only the asset management function and the metadata behind it and the work processes behind it, the risk behind it, but how that's overlaid into the smart digital reality. This particular plant happens to be one of those examples in that art of the possible, what can be done, perhaps in your organization or within the other case studies that we've seen, where we look at the designs, we overlay them with the real world, we capture those conditions, and we understand how to get early warning about our assets. Now, when we look at those designs, there's ways that we have to capture that. There's ways that we have to gather that condition. And typically what we can do with that is take advantage of our Leica tool sets, which involve drones. Now these drones may be things that fly. These drones may be things that walk. These drones may be things that you carry, or it could be on a backpack, or it could be interrogators that are there. When I think about what's done on here is what I see is an assessment of the real world. And I want to compare that to what the design world should be. And I want to understand what those notifications are those early warnings that we talked about before. So as I go throughout with this particular view, I can see that the alert happens to be someone identifying that a, a suspect bearing is about to fail. Now, when I see that, I can take a look and say, okay, all else being equal, all the failures that I've recorded, all the analysis that I've done, what's probably gonna happen is this particular bearing is gonna fail. And what can I do to resolve it? I can actually print the, bar the, the, the part out. I can order the part or I can have it shipped in. In this case, it's something that I can print out. So I automatically send it through that autonomous capability to have that printed out. I look at the assembly structure to bring it back into place and I bring that piece of equipment back online. 
these are things that can benefit your organization. And this is where autonomy comes into play. This is where the design expectation of that asset meets the real world. Thank you. Thank you to Julian and Kevin for two great presentations. As always, it's now your turn to get involved. Um, if you could please ask our quest uh, speakers questions via the YouTube chat box and who your question is directed to. A big thank you also to everyone who submitted questions whilst registering. And we might start with some of those. Um, Julian, starting with you, we've had a question that's coming from Lee jo, and Lee jo is watching from Victoria. Good afternoon to you. Asking you, Julian, we all know asset management is important on the long run, but this never comes to the top at budget time um, to do something about it. Do you have any tips, Julian? Thank you. Amanda, hi, and thanks for the question, um, Lee Joe. I think that's a really important one that I think we get a lot um, from different sectors, different clients as well, and dealing with this, um, how do you fund, how do you secure funding, and how do you get your stakeholders and your board and your different um, levels of governance to, uh, to be willing to invest it really does come back to, are you clear on the business case? Are you clear on your, your benefits? Are you clear on the problem statement that you're trying to solve for? And are you able to translate that to senior management? <clears throat> and when you're thinking of translating that, can you translate it in terms of the cost, the real costs, um, in terms of co cost out, in terms of safety, or in terms of customer satisfaction and service levels? Um, so when you're thinking about doing that, how can you do that in a way that, that your solution or your proposed approach to deal with this um, actually links the funding that you're requesting back to solving the problem? And have you really got yourself a, a business sponsor or a beneficiary that's willing to sign up to that so that you've got a customer to then say, I have I have to deliver this. It's solving a business, business problem. We've articulated it to our senior management. And we're able to say that this isn't just maintaining steady state. This is about moving to a new level, to a transformation. So treat it as such, treat it as a business change activity, not just a technology change or an asset change ch challenge. Um, and effectively, if you're not able to articulate that in the best way uh, to your senior management, maybe it means you need to do a bit more investigation. You need to collect a bit more data, have a bit more evidence. Um, and that's a really uh, important part to, to having that justification and being able to confidently say, this is why we need to have um, these activities funded uh, when it comes to budget setting time. Thanks, Julian. Kevin, have you anything to add to that? Well, this is why we need to have these budgeted. Um, just to echo that, and one of the main reasons why is because if you don't know why you're going down this journey to be able to put more focus, to add more methodology, to add sometimes more complexity to how you manage that asset, then it's going to be very difficult to be able to request those funds. And we do that typically in the beginning of the journey by identifying what that asset is and why you have it and what the risk is when it fails and making sure that the culture at the organization understands that. Um, when you start to develop up a culture of reliability and you're all speaking the same language in terms of what reliability results and consequences are, that process of defining that budget does become a bit easier. But it does take a lot of upfront work to be able to move that culture in the same direction. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And staying with you, Kevin, we've had a question that's coming from Nermal. And Nermal is watching in WA, asking you, Kevin, what are the first steps towards the path to achieve predictive maintenance? Thanks, Kevin. Well, that's a good segue from the last question, I think. Um, one of the main reasons is because we go back to the why. Why do you want to be able to take that journey for predictive maintenance for this particular asset? And you really need to underscore that time spent. Um, I just mentioned it before, is that a culture of reliability and a culture of definition? Because when you start to have the same vernacular and how you define risk and how you define failure and how you define consequences of that failure, you have a better appreciation for what it is. When you do that, 
then you start to have attribution of that asset in a better way. You start to capture more detail in its structure. You start to make it more formulated and templated. You start to also look at the work processes that affect that. When you do that, you start to look at that failure analysis definition, the, the capture in the field of what's out there. I say all that because when you, when you have that foundation, you have that structure, you have that ability, then you can start looking at automating those failures as we talked about in the seven steps. When you can automate those routine measures, you can understand when failures happen, then that automate that automation becomes a lot more predictable. And what you can do is start taking the elements that bring it to that state so that you can predict those. And that may be condition monitor. That may be something like vibration sensor, heat definition. It could also be something that's even acoustic that you want to be able to do. But you have to really spend a lot of time understanding that asset, why it's there, what it does when it starts to fail, how it fails, and what the consequences are. And when you start to understand that very well, and the organization understands that very well, and the elements to produce the scenario when it does fail is going to be a lot easier. And of course, the digital nature of which you transform that to asset management functions becomes a lot more clear. I hope that answers the question. It's a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Julian, um, a great question is coming from Sam. Sam's watching from Victoria asking, how can asset management help with equipment reliability if a maintenance event itself can lead to operational catastrophic failure? Julian. Uh, sure, thanks, Amanda and, and Sam for your question. Um, and, and I think maybe with this one, it's about understanding the difference between asset management and managing assets. And there was a great pub paper that was published um, by the, the TC251 committee for the ISO 5000 around the sort of separation, if you like, around uh, do we understand the business of managing of asset management um, and uh, how we've defined asset management as the, you know, the realization, the, the value that we get from our asset base and that the asset management system, if you like, the management system that wraps around that the business management system um, is about the, the, those organizational activities that realize value from that asset base and the, the coordinated activities between um, within the organization. And in that context, you're really thinking of governance and assurance, uh, things like configuration management, operational readiness. So when you have a, a piece of equipment that might be business critical, um, that can create a catastrophic failure. If you have done your criticality across your equipment and across your functions, then you can have appropriate levels of controls in place at a business level at, at those assurance and governance activities so that you can try to design those controls in a way that reduces the risk of business critical functions causing business critical failures. Um, and I think that's, that's a key part when you're trying to separate out, um, is this an individual piece of equipment that could fail, that could cause a, a business uh, event uh, or is this um, a, a business activity that needs to be undertaken to to really drive um, uh, assurance and governance activities? Thank you, Julian. And it's good the sensors are working down at KPMG, saving energy. Uh, Kevin, oh, absolutely. <laughs> Kevin, is there anything that was that was quite a broad question? Is there anything you want to add to that one? No, it was actually spot on. Really excellent stellar response. I can't top anything on that. That was really well said, Julian. Okay. I just so need we'll to get go to so that we can put the lights on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Much better. <laughs> Over to Queensland now, and we've had a question from Joshua. Good afternoon to you. Asking you, Kevin, how can machine performance and operational data be used at an initial level to drive better efficiency and overall performance? Thanks, Kevin. So the wonderful question, Joshua, and this one really gets into some of those things that we pay attention in this space, such as overall equipment effectiveness ratings. Um, getting that machine data in a regular interval, um, and then also looking at some of the performance characteristics that that can make up. There is a question that we always struggle with over the years. Um, we, at an asset management solution set, happen to be in that state of the, the management information structure where we have to integrate with a lot of tools. Um, we have to bring into condition monitors on a regular basis. We have to bring into machine runtime data on a regular basis. 
And the question is always, should we bring it in there? And what we're finding recently on this particular market is quite interesting because what it's doing is that we have, as an example, a customer right now that has 22 different alert management and condition monitoring systems. And each one of them come from a different type of original equipment manufacturer or maybe something that's done contractor development to it. So how do they capture that data? What do they make sense of it? And what they're finding is a lot of that data becomes insurmountable um, to the point where it's almost difficult to infer anything out of it and still pay attention to some of the elements of the basic practices of that asset management for that asset. So what they're finding is that they're incorporating more algorithmic responses by taking the data, putting it outside, understanding performance and operational characteristics from that separate data set and perhaps a data lake, and then sending it over to a system like EAM to be able to have contextual response. Um, this allows the opportunity to incorporate other types of engineering to those data sets, data scientists that get involved, reliability-centered works that get involved. Uh, we do this on a regular basis with some of our tools, but I definitely think it's a decision when you start to look at those different types of operational characteristics. Do you use some of the classics like OEE? Do they make sense for that particular piece of equipment? Is there another type of more statistical analysis that I want to incorporate because I get more data from it? Um, again, it, for me, it goes back to the question of the nature of the asset, what kind of information that you can capture, when it fails, what the consequences are, what the failure elements are, the conditions of those failures, and then where you can keep that data. But it's a, it's been an evolving answer to that question. Sorry for that type of response, but that's what we've seen lately. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Kevin. Um, over to New South Wales, Julian. We've got a question that's coming from Stratos asking you, Julian. The ideal in asset management is well defined, but are there business cases to get the resources to support the ideal, which we talked on before, as the ideal requires more money and time? Yeah, and um, thanks, Samantha, and um, several for your question. I think this, just to separate out, if you like, the, the request before about how to get the funding through the through the board um, versus are we trying to um, have more money and more time. I think this is probably around um, you know, implementation of asset management and, and the concepts and the principles. It's not about necessarily jumping straight to the global ideal. It's not about saying, well, this is this is what the book says. Therefore, we have to do everything and implement everything all at once. It's more about defining what is appropriate and optimized for your organization. And in a similar way to risk, if you say that um, we only really seek to eliminate risk when the consequence is un unacceptable. Um, in most cases, we're more about setting our risk appetite and then optimizing to that level of risk. And it's the same with asset management. It's more about how can you set the target level and the target objective and work backwards from an incremental roadmap perspective to achieving that future state. And so it's, it's not sort of saying that this is the ideal, we have to jump to that, we need lots of time and money to, to create a big program. It's more about saying what is appropriate, um, what are the next steps that we can demonstrate that that business case that I mentioned before, demonstrate return on investment, um, demonstrate the, the benefits and, and customer outcomes that, that can come from that, uh, and then take that on a journey um, and take, take your organisation on that same journey. Thank you. Thanks for that, Julian. Um, Kevin, we've had a question from David who's watching from sunny Queensland. Talking about culture, uh, asking you, Kevin, what is the most important part of embedding a reliability culture in an organization? Thanks, Kevin. Language, 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 language. Um, just coming to an agreement on vernacular. There are a lot of different organizations out there. Um, I am, of course, I'm a big fan of, and a lot of the different ways in which they define elements of risk. Uh, different ways they identify what other asset register is. These seem like basic tenets, basic concepts, but the first thing that you can do is get the major stakeholders or leader of stakeholder groups and get them involved on a certification journey of reliability and vernacular. Once you can be able to establish that, then you're actually talking about similar practices, similar goals, similar functions to reach those goals and similar expectations on what you should expect them to benefit the organization. When you can reach those particular commonalities, 
then as you start to need to take pivots in the organization, everyone's on the same page and they know why. You know what particular goal you're going after and if you're starting to miss it or go over achieve it, you can understand why. The biggest, biggest conflict that we've always seen in to driving that culture and driving that communication and driving that language is having the buy-in from the organization. And what we typically find there is going back again to when a critical piece of equipment fails or to have a catastrophic failure, or even just to have a negligible failure, what does that mean to the organization? How does it affect work in progress? How does it affect service level? How does it affect warranty? Does it affect someone that's in a personal safety environment? Bringing those, those things to a head and talking about them and just having that collaboration and that shared language is such a valuable tool if you can be able to drive it. Thanks, Kevin. Communicating I, and collaborating. I add, Julian. I add to that as well, because I think, Kevin, that of you course. nailed it in terms of that, that sort of growth mindset around culture and, and baking it into what you do. But I think the other parts that come through um, with the um, with the with the global documentation is about leadership and demonstrating that leadership and, and empowering that through all levels in the organization. So, you know, culture eat strategy for breakfast. Um, how can you demonstrate through your leadership that we are committed to this type of way of thinking? Um, and it's not just around reliability, it could be about sustainability, it could be about um, uh, thinking of, of different ways to, to drive strategy through, but can we see that coming through in our leaders? and um, have our leaders empowered all of our people to live that um, that same culture and, and um, make sure that it is part of your fabric and not just something that happens at a point in time. Absolutely. Thank you. And who said that? Was it Drucker? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> Trying to remember. <laughs> um, Kevin, we've had a question come in from Abbas. Good afternoon to you, asking mm -hmm. you, Kevin. Do you believe we need to consider asset risks, both qualitative and quantitative, when evaluating asset performance management? Thank you, Abbas, for your question. Absolutely. Um, I would say 10,000% if I could. Um, when you look at those qualitative definitions, though, they are different um, and they're typically subjective. So again, going back to the idea of collaboration, going out to the idea of vernacular, going to the language that shared models for it, having the buy-in of organizational leadership that's, that's built into it um, is gonna be very important when you bring about the qualitative ones. Quantitative has very little opportunity to argue. It's going to be a number. It's gonna be something that you really can't not justify. It's just something you see, that you understand, that you deal with. But when you start to go to the qualitative definitions for asset management, good, poor, um, optimum, these are all arguable contexts, but they can be resolved in terms of their appreciation and their agreement on what that criticality is if you have that education involved, if you have that collaboration, that language, and that shared vernacular. But when you should you consider this? Absolutely, 100%. Thank you, Kevin. I had a great question come in from Callum as we get towards the end of this session saying that both of you raised IoT devices as tools for moving for, uh, towards predictive maintenance. These are great in principle, but are often hamstrung technically. How can organisations integrate these systems better? Julian, do you want to kick off with your answer? Uh, sure, thanks. Callum, for that question, and you know this this movement to can we keep our finger on the pulse and be more up to date with things? Um, I think that the challenge of you know the growth of of IoT devices and they become cheaper and more accessible, um, but they're still somewhat misunderstood in terms of do we have the right level of monitoring for the right level of uh, of lead indicators that can lead to failures. And do we actually need to monitor that at a, at a real-time basis? Or do we need to look at what is the, the genuine uh, lead indicators to a failure and monitor those? And those might happen at a, at a less frequent level. We could look at different technologies. It's not always jumping to IoT as the answer for monitoring those. But even if you do move to IoT, your point around how can you integrate that into your technology stack can be a challenge as well, because you have a lot of data coming through um, at, at, at any one time, you have things like I'm monitoring my, my points on a railway and it's telling me I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, until I'm not okay. 
do you really need all of that, that data or do you just need the trends coming through? Can you do edge computing to reduce that level of, of data flow coming through onto your servers um, and just have um, the trends that are, that are saying this is how it's trending towards a failure event or um, how you're picking up the, um, the lead indicators for that event to occur. Um, so there are ways to, to try and look at what, what is your, how does your data stack fit together in a way that's integrated and, and just takes what it needs without overloading um, with, with a lot of information that can come from IoT sensors. And it's not just IoT, the, the definition kind of bleeds into anything that you're monitoring. What is the frequency and the fidelity of update that actually informs decision making? Thank you. Kevin. So um, a friend of mine brings in a, an insane amount of data from their onboard telemetry systems for some of the vehicles that they maintain. He maintains a fleet of a few thousand pieces of equipment. So if you multiply that moving fleet of a few thousand and you multiply at times hundreds of points of data collection that come in, this is an absolute avalanche tsunami of data that's coming through. Um, what he's found is a lot of this is, is somewhat structured, um, but for the most part is unstructured and it makes it hamstrung is a very good word to put it on how you put that to the system and how you make sense of it. Um, what we typically do and what he does is his very generic saying is throw it into the data lake and we'll figure it out later. And what he means by that is, is pretty critical um, because it's a lot of different data sets coming from different places. It's unstructured, some of it's structured. And what he tends to do is he actually gets a lot of college and universities involved to be able to have their data scientists do exercise on those data, try to find trends, try to try and anomalies with it. And when they can be able to locate it, he then evaluates that, understand its impact, and then takes a look at something that he can be able to incorporate more perfectly into their enterprise asset management operations. Perfectly meaning it's not necessarily that large amount of data, as Julia mentions, it's an edge piece of data that comes in or it's a contextualized piece of coming in. But um, the IoT can definitely hamstring in, in a way. I totally agree with that because it could be based on just the technical data sets, the, the uh, unstructured data sets that comes in, the varying data sets that come in. Um, but typically what we see is our customers want to put it into an environment that's by nature unstructured and then start to put structure behind it and understand it. Once you can do that, then you can be able to understand, is this data something that can drive my operation, that deters my operation, or something that I can use in the practice? And it's going to become apparently clear once you're able to take that time and that effort to go through it. Thanks, Kevin. We are getting to the end now. So I just would ask you both, starting with you, Julian, just really quickly, what are your key takeouts that you want to leave our audience with today? And the same then for you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Amanda. Just, I guess, to, to wrap up uh, the session, we've been talking about um, how can we set appropriate business practices in place to focus on the big outcomes that our assets need to deliver, and then how can we translate those into actual activities that help to deliver the reliability and maintenance that is needed from the asset base. So I think the, the key takeaways is have that line of sight. Um, be, un, be clear on what you're trying to yeah. deliver as an organization and how those assets have uh, a direct impact on that. And if you don't have that, it is very difficult to say what level of reliability, what level of intervention do I need to do um, to, to realize that outcome? Do I have the right mix of my asset base that, that um, delivers to that future customer need? Um, so I think that, that big picture um, line of sight is first key takeaway. Um, and the second one would be um, engage with your stakeholders. Be really clear on the benefits and the outcomes that you're, that you're tracking towards and, um, and do that in a way that engages people, that, that ties back to um, uh, a, an analogy that is, that is business critical, that links back to this is why we're here. This is we love we love delivering outcomes from our asset bases. We're generally passionate about it, um, but at the same time, we need to be able to translate that into the boardroom, into um, our executives, to to make sure that they understand the the drivers and the needs behind um, how we reinvest and how we how we deliver outcomes. Uh, so I'll leave you with those two. 
Kevin. So the, the second one I'd like to, to first appreciate um, in a big way, because it's, it's one of my major takeaways in any conversation around reliability, risk asset management, and um, really predictive maintenance and also asset performance management. It's making sure that everyone is on the same page in the organization. Uh, again, language is critical. Collaboration is critical. Understanding risk is very critical, and that needs to be a routine thing. Um, asset management and really asset performance management is what it is in our in our view is something that's organizationally responsible. It doesn't just go to tech to the to the technicians. It doesn't go to maintenance. It doesn't go to engineering. It doesn't go to procurement. It doesn't go to the operations. It doesn't go to the executive office. It goes to everyone at the same time. And if there's not an appreciation for these assets and what they do, and when they fail, when they operate correctly, um, when their budget needs to be increased then you're never going to get to that same page. Um, do everything you can in the beginning to get people on the same page. Get them on the same page to understand the asset, get them on the page to understand those risks, and of course, get them on the same page simply to understand the goals of when those assets are supposed to run correctly. And when you do that, a lot of these other elements, the technology component will be there. Um, the tech is there already. Um, the practices are there to incorporate but the biggest drive and the biggest effort you should put on is in the very beginning of that process to get people on the same page. Thank you, thank you. And that is all the time we have for today. So please join me once again in thanking Julian Watts and Kevin Price for two great presentations and a fantastic discussion. I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia industry partner Hexagon for their ongoing support. Uh, Kevin has joined us today from Florida, where he has been attending the 37th Annual International Maintenance Conference. And I'm delighted that thought leaders, that we have a scoop, um, that Hexagon have actually won the winner of the Best Digital Transformation for Asset Management Solution Award. So congratulations to Kevin and all the team. As always, we're looking at ways to plan for the future, particularly as we go into a new year. So could you please take a couple of minutes to complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below. Thank you again for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you at our next, which will be our last Thought Leaders webinar, which is happening next week. So thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>